just because uh, the beginning is like a black screen, so I kind of skipped ahead to uh, get a different backdrop. Yeah, The Forgotten History of Reboot by Wooly Versus. This game hotly recommended by a member of our great community. And I was very curious uh, because I personally, in my own uh, free time, watch a lot of Wooly. I um, mentioned this occasionally on the channel. I listen to Castle Super Beast podcast that he's featured on. I listen to uh, the more recent one, uh, which is Versus Wolves, that he does with Super Eye Patch Wolf. I watch their old channel called uh, Super Two Best Friends and then Super Best Friends uh, play. And uh, yeah, I've, I've been following this group of uh, fucking YouTubers for so long. Uh, Wooly and Pa personally got me into fucking Jojo. Like, some of my favorite media, like Devil May Cry, is, like, direct recommendations from them, essentially. I believe their, I believe their old podcast is how I got into, like, Persona at all. Like, I didn't know what the fuck Persona is before um, Matt and Pat uh, did, a, did an episode uh, about Persona for Golden, uh, for two best friends play. So I have a, like, long established history with with this channel and I know Wooly has been talking a lot about the reboot I never like really gotten into it myself I think it's like a first uh, CG show on tele in television history so uh, yeah when this video got recommended to me I was like you know what I should go uh, back and watch this because because of all the things I heard in my life like uh, second hand about reboot I, I, I would like to find out some more so uh, here we are with the forgotten history of reboot by Wooly Versus, and yeah, let's see, uh, let's see what tale of executive scumbaggery because I'm sure there will be some executive meddling, of course, in a fucking original passionate project as there always is. So yeah, let's uh, let Wooly take it away. Hi, hey, hello, hey there. Thanks for click and play. I'm an irrelevant YouTuber. My opinions don't matter. And I'm sitting here with a microphone feeling some kind of way because never in my life have I had so much to say about something I don't want to talk about. If there's a word for this, help me out. I have no idea what it is. But nevertheless, I'm going to try to unpack the gist of my thoughts here because I figure it's about time I explained why I've chosen to permanently represent myself with this logo right here. Once upon a time, there was a sarcastic intro to this video that tried to capture the deadening of my soul at the continuous prods from innocent folks just trying to know if, hey, have you heard about the fact that Reboot's being rebooted? It involved me explaining with a pained expression that Reboot's been rebooting since 2007 and that there's literally been a press release hyping up absolutely nothing once a year, every single year since then. Speaking hypothetically, given that we're now way beyond that, having laid eyes on the travesty that is the Guardian Code. Man, like every time I, uh, every time I happen upon a community like, like Reboot, like Homeworld, you know, like fucking, I don't know, Mega Man, Castlevania, right? Those IPs that are like treated with zero fucking respect. I always like count myself lucky that I never was part of this. So yeah, uh, I, I'm like, I'm, I, I am very happy that I never was part of a community that uh, gotten this shafted uh, in my life because that my, that fucking must sting, man. From its casting call, to its trailer, and its eventual release on Netflix worldwide, except for, you know, the country that the show <laughs> originated from. Uh, the mood has okay. changed, and that smarm is pretty much all but evaporated. My only hope concerning the subject is that this awful, long-winded, dry-red introduction to this video will serve to convey a similar state of my beheaded, sodomized, and disemboweled childhood, bloody limbs and torso ripped apart and currently being paraded through the streets on sticks, marching in step to the intro theme of Code Lyoko. Now, with that detailed image vividly playing in your mind, we're ready to tackle the simple yet spiritually exhausting question. Man, Co Code Lyoko had a fucking banger as intro. Also, it was trippy as fuck. Man, 
man, like their old channel had some fucking banger ass intros. Holy shit. Hot take, Devil Man Cry Baby wasn't very good. I completely fucking agree, man. I uh, I tried watching Devil Man Cry Baby because like PewDiePie wouldn't uh, shut up about how much he loves Devil Man Cry Baby. And I was so fucking disappointed, man. It, like, wasn't entertaining in the slightest, but I know it has a lot of fans, so... Uh, yeah, I definitely agree in any, in any case. Reboot's the first thing I'd ever seen on television that changed my life. You can go ahead, roll your eyes at that, that's cool, it's totally fine, I'll wait. Reboot is a 3D animated Canadian series that aired in 1994 on YTV and ABC. It was produced by Mainframe Entertainment. The concept was created by Gavin Blair, Ian Pearson, Phil Mitchell, and John Grace, while its art direction was done by Brendan McCarthy of Judge Dredd, TMNT, and Fury Road fame. In fact, you can watch the whole thing oh. online for free right here at this link. It was a charming, idiosyncratic show that targeted kids who spent all day thinking about video games with a weird sense of humor and a strong setting. Bits and punchlines ranged from downright hilarious to literally no one born after 1967 is going to get this reference to the prisoner, Dan Didio. What are you doing? It's visually dated enough that every time a sweet summer child stares at my hat, realizes it's not a Triforce, and decides to look up the source, there's a handful of remarks that usually follow along the lines of, Wow, why are you obsessed with something that looks so bad? For what it's worth, contextually, Reboot was the best looking 3D animated show at the time. See, I mean, it was the only 3D animated show at the time, I think. If you take a look here, you can compare its closest competitor at the time, Nothing, and you'll see that Reboot shaders and render engine are quite actually a bit more nuanced. It was literally the first fully 3D animated television show ever made. Prior to this, your only bet was live action with 3D sprinkled in. And even then, the good stuff was exclusively for films with a name like Spielberg attached. Otherwise, you're hanging out with Captain Power and the Soldiers of the Future. I vividly remember watching the very first promo that aired before the show ever came out and not understanding what I was seeing. I was used to movie CG being cued into live shots, but this was clearly different. This was something that wasn't attempting to be realistic at all. It was some sort of new shiny form of cartooning. There was camera movement, and I just remember failing to wrap my head around exactly what I- I, I mean, to be fair, uh... Let me... There was camera movement, and I just remember- I mean, to be fair, I still, like, to this day think that, um, like, CGI-based shows have fucking nothing on 2D, uh, drowned ones when it comes to art style and, like, uh, basically everything. So, I, I, I would never, even as a child and while this was new and exciting, I would have never gotten into this because, like, to me, that strong, exaggerated art style of, like, cartoons is, uh, is just so much more visually interesting, you know? Like, one of my, one of my one, uh, all-time favorites, uh, shows from my childhood is Ed, 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 Ed and Eddie, and that had such a fucking crazy art style for a child cartoon, you know? Colors that don't make sense, like texture on texture and patterns on things that shouldn't have texture and patterns. The fucking mismatch of like all of the visuals on screen, Eddie the Eddie is like a fucking acid trip from hell, but it's such an entertaining show for that, uh, because it looks so wildly different. I guess you could say, say, uh, the same about this, so it just comes down to personal preference. Because, like, this is also very wildly different. They described it as building a car while the car is uh, already lo rolling down the hill. Oh, sorry, this is a follow-up to your previous comment. The technical details are interesting since this show hadn't been done before. They were trying to figure out how to make it, how, how to make it while making it. So, yeah, I guess that, that part is very interesting for sure. I remember failing to wrap my head around exactly what I was looking at, but also <laughs> realizing that it was the coolest thing I had ever seen. I was excited at the prospect of, like, a whole new type of cartoon, a whole new medium to 
to to animate with and 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 to create characters, build worlds, tell stories. It was something that was really different from the traditional older methods that I had grown up with and was used to. And I was right on time for the introduction of 3D animation, not as an accessory for film, but as a self-contained medium. To my young mind, it was like witnessing the first time in history that a story was told with fully hand-drawn animation. I could tell something important was just invented, or at the very least, just hit a point or a plateau of significance. And I wanted to learn everything I could about it. By the time the first season was wrapping up, I was learning to use 3D Studio 4 and DOS with a life goal of one day working for mainframe entertainment. Oh man, that is okay. That is kind of fucking, uh, that is kind of fucking cute. Keep in mind this aired in uh, 1994. Okay, I thought it aired like a couple of years later, uh, like 98 or fucking 99, so... It is uh, definitely older than I thought it is. It's still n not that much like older, but uh, but the nineties, like the nineties, every fucking year that passed was such a leap in technological advancement. It was kind of a different time too. Uh, so I guess it's fair. I wasn't alive back then, so I couldn't. Even if I was, this looks too radical to be airing in fucking Poland uh, of 2000s. So, uh, you know, so probably still wouldn't catch that. I digress, but I guess the point is, sure, yeah, the characters could barely put one foot in front of the other for the first season, but God bless them, <laughs> I wouldn't have it any other way. I really wouldn't. When it comes to voice acting, we're talking Kathleen Barr, Gary Chalk, Michael Benier, Michael Donovan, Scott McNeil, Stevie Valance, Sharon Alexander, Paul Dobson, and Tony J. The various, various children as well that played Enzo Matrix. There's a lot of awesome talent that went into the voice acting on this show over the years. You've got to acknowledge it. My format. Virus. The queen of chaos. Reboot will return after these messages. Right about that, even in the show, they had massive leaps in technological improvements uh, as it aired. I, I do wonder, like, uh, how radically different it looks before, uh, like, between first episode and the last episode of the, like, original, uh, original series. We now return to Reboot. Reboot is about the adventures of Bob, a reference to Rowan Atkinson's Black Adder. Bob. Yes! Well, Bob. 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 Guardian of Mainframe, the city inside of a computer, and his friends Dot Matrix, as in printer, and Enzo Matrix, as in tiny Italian child. They fight to protect the citizens, sprites, and binomes from viruses who would corrupt and conquer, such as Megabyte, as in digital storage, and Hexadecimal, as in the numeral system. But most importantly, they protect the city from the user, an analog for us, the humans unknowingly endangering the lives of mainframers every time we boot up a computer game. Video games are killing people, folks. <laughs> well, not people so much as... well. And the point is, I mean, uh, video games, uh, like, that? in the year of our Lord 2024, video games are actually putting lives in danger uh, with all the fucking layoffs and people, like, losing their, uh, the security of their job overnight. So, yeah, video games are killing people. Actually, straight fucking up man and also uh like also def the all the death threats and like actual violence targeted uh at uh you know voice actors writers fucking directors who might have voiced like a character that is bad or directed something that is not good you know i'm so silent because honestly i have nothing to say but this is kind of mesmerizing yeah it's like uh, looking into a time capsule from Almost another world, you know. The future, the future that the kids in '94 were dreaming of is a probably way different future that we have gotten in the end. But holy shit, that was 30 years ago, man. That is so long ago. 
when a game is played, a game S cube. So this much has fucking changed. Sends from the skies and drops on a section of the city. All those trapped inside must act as AI for that game, challenging the human player. When the user is defeated, the game is over and the cube returns to parts unknown. But if the user wins, all who are a part of it are nullified, which is a fate worse than deletion. Effectively, since all the citizens are somewhere on a computer and nothing on a hard drive ever really gets erased, the data that is these citizens just kind of gets wiped and they effectively lose everything that makes them who and what they are, becoming goopy, squishy little slug-like creatures that can't do much besides squirm around, feel pain, and spoilers. Huge, huge spoilers. Speaking of spoilers, let's get into some, shall we? Largely identifiable by its constant attempts to break the chains of age-appropriate censorship in the early years, Reboot from the get-go wasn't so much about pushing the envelope as much as it was about trying to be itself while accidentally discovering that the envelope exists. Characters like <laughs> Dot, despite being conservatively dressed, were deemed too sexual by the boards of standards and practices. and were forced to have her chest remodeled to what is now referred to as the mono breast. The situation is pretty similar to a show like Invader Zim. So they found themselves constantly being content swatted by nonsensical censorship, including but not limited to an older sister kissing her brother on the cheek promotes incest, and hockey is offensive slang in certain countries. <laughs> what the fuck are they talking about, man? <laughs> made no sense. Forced to deal with this endless censorship and board filing of seemingly random complaints in order to validate their own existence, perhaps? Who knows? The reboot as a show fought back where it could, but... Damn. Blowballed. It was rough. Either way, they still took us on family-friendly video game adventures inside the computer, and that's all we really expected of them at the time. It's important to understand all this suppression so that I can recontextualize where the show goes next. Ending the second season on an uncharacteristically dark cliffhanger, leading to the loss of the main character Bob, an all-out war breaks out. Originally created to fill the role of insert child that kids can relate to, the immature character Enzo is suddenly forced into having responsibility, something he's always wanted, but then so. Thrust into a world of wartime responsibilities, with shoes way too big for him to possibly fill, Episode after episode goes by, unafraid to end with the day no longer being saved because Robin is not Batman. For those of you taking notes, the momentum that took Reboot to new heights... So what you're saying is this is Guren Lagan before Guren Lagan existed. Okay, okay. Now, now we're getting into something, some interesting te uh, territory. Uh, Re Reboot uh, constantly made fun of the BSP, and in one episode they had a hidden fuck you BSP written in binary. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> certified haters. Episodes also couldn't have cliffhangers because that would leave kids with traumatic tension. When they stopped caring, they literally added a, a giant dick-shaped gun that Dot shot from the hip. <laughs> That's fucking great, man. Fuck the censorship. Like, as long as it's not, like, actually fucking offensive or teaching, like, some really questionable ethics, like, why wouldn't you let people go all out, man? Uh, like, I'm, I'm watching... For the first time, I'm rewatching the entirety of uh, Adventure Time. Uh, because it's like it's like on Netflix and it has a, like a full Dutch dubbing, so I'm kind of watching it to uh, learn to listen to the language better. And that's fucking uh, Adventure Time is fucking crazy, man. The shit they they did in that uh, in that show is crazy. There is a scene where a character just fucking. There are multiple scenes where a character just dies and they write it in as a joke, uh, like. 
holy fuck and sometimes it's a punchline that is like completely hilarious like other times there are concepts introduced that are so fucked up like a soul sucking vampire literally making everybody he comes across uh, into zombies and the base the base of world building is that this uh, adventure time is a post apo show because literally every second episode you look at the background and you see ruined buildings and like abandoned fucking atomic shelters and it's played it's played in such a goofy way and it's a show that is for children uh, despite all of that it's fucking crazy man like you can get away with so much shit just because children won't be looking that deep into the things on screen you know and also kids don't care that characters fucking die as long as it's not obviously like gory and stuff so yeah I don't, I, I don't get like censorship of, uh, especially since it kind of ruins a lot of things in uh, shows. So yeah, definitely fuck, fuck BSP, man. In later seasons, actually all started with a chain of events that kicked off in season two, episode five, Painted Windows. After forcefully having her mask removed, an extremely traumatized hexadecimal is left with Mike the TV to help her recover. Instead of doing this, of course, he instead unwittingly releases a web creature into the offline computer city of Mainframe from Hexadecimal's lair. As we all now know, nothing good comes from connecting to the internet. Not even once. The important take. I mean, isn't uh, isn't that the plot of uh, fucking Avengers? Age of Ultron that he connected to the internet and he was like, man, fuck all of humanity, you all fucking deserve to die. Takeaway is that absolutely everything bad that has ever happened in Reboot is Mike Zero, I mean Mike the TV's fault. Meanwhile in the real world, despite good ratings, the show is promptly cancelled and Disney buys ABC. It's the ABCs, they've turned on us. Treacherous dogs. Fortunately, as a Canadian production... <laughs> it continued into season three on YTV and eventually Cartoon Network. While initial plans to follow up season two with a movie called Terabyte Rising fell short, Mainframe's investment... Yes, pretty much, yeah. Man, you know what? He was kind of right, though. <laughs> like, every time I log on, every time I log on to Twitter and look at some funny tweets, then I scroll into replies and I'm like, you know what? Ultron was fucking right, man. ...in better software led to a massive technical improvement over models, animation quality, the whole show really. Similarly, without ABC in the picture, Mainframe was free to write a show for ages 12 and up, allowing them to completely abandon the loosely episodic format in favor of an ongoing, directly continuous plot. On a personal note, as a longtime fan of fighting games, watching the different genres being parodied from episode to episode had me hyperactively waiting for the day that we'd finally get to see a fighting <laughs> game. Okay, that's that's a groovy ass reference. I haven't been back on Twitter in a while and I'm happy for it. I, I get that, but at the same time, my problem is that I genuinely like my Twitter for you page is fucking hilarious. Like it has almost, uh, it, it's compromised of, um, it, it, it's actually uh, comprised of uh, game news and like actual like funny memes and the problem is just the replies and I ca I always have this uh, knee-jerk reaction to scroll into replies because on YouTube comment top comments are usually fucking good you know but on Twitter it's obviously the fucking blue check marks that you see first and it's like I fucking stroked my dick to this uh, animation check out fucking balls in bio or something and it's like oh, okay man shut the fuck up and like muting all of those accounts takes so much time and there will be like new dickheads filling in the void so the more we go on the more i actually want to watch this same man this is this is uh this is some quality ass television man and a move that would lock me in as pretty much a fan for life you can imagine when the day came <laughs> It was not only the nice. perfect send-up to Mortal Kombat, but it turned out to be the most important episode of the entire series. The day that the user won. Did I mention the improved animation quality? Here it goes. Get ready. The user wins.
holy shit, you can feel the tension. Uh, you can fucking feel the tension in the air just from this one scene. Oh my god. I only go on Twitter for the furry art and only take minute dips into whatever political brain rot if I'm curious. <laughs> Sanest Twitter user ever. <laughs> Oh, man. That's where the kid loses his eye. Yeah, I fucking noticed, man. Like, he just fucking lost his eye. Are we gonna, like... Are we just gonna gloss over that? Enzo. No. No! <laughs> <laughs> Holy fuck, imagine like watching this as a kid, man. What the fuck? That would like legitimately shake me up. <laughs> Faced with imminent nullification upon losing the game, replacement guardian Enzo, Andrea, and their dog Frisket play their final hand, rebooting themselves to be recognized as part of the GameCube, allowing them to survive but forcing them to leave mainframe inside of the GameCube forever. This in turn kicks off a time jump to a new story arc where the wandering group has aged, hopping from game to game, surviving in unknown systems, searching for a way home. This was a bold, unexpected direction that made many, including myself, fall in love with the series again. That's fucking crazy, man. What the fuck? Holy shit, man. That's like, uh, that's like fucking Guren Lagan meets Mad Max. Holy god damn. As we were now long beyond the happy-go-lucky days of yore and fully invested in seeing these young characters we cared about start to develop real personalities, while simultaneously beginning to see parts of the world only mentioned offhandly in previous seasons. Look, the point is <laughs> that the dog is so fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> he looks so funny. That it was a trip, man. It was a trip. From the episode Bad Bob, which on record served, by the way, as the early inspiration for Mad Max Fury Road, to Tank and Tyrannosaurus fusions, to Sergio Leone on Tatooine-inspired adventures in the episode with no name, to the hunt for Bob in literally poisonous airs of the web. Man, kids in the... the they expected fucking kids in the 90s to get a reference to a man with no name. Are you fucking kidding me? I mean, to be fair, uh, Rango did the same thing. I don't know if you guys watched that, uh, watched that like, uh, animated movie. Rango had so many fucking obscure ass references that what kind of fucking, what kind of fucking child would, uh, would get all of it. There's just so many cool ideas. Yeah, this this show looks like it had some... Like, uh, despite, uh, like I said, the presentation is still not it for me. But, like, the ideas are fucking wild, man. S holy. I saw that. I thought it was good. Rango was all right. It's not, like, the best animated movie I have ever watched. But it was pretty all right. Like, the fucking... Uh, the main villain actually... the. He was he wasn't even like the main villain, but like the fucking uh, snake uh, was actually terrifying. He he gets like the second place in the most terrifying like uh, antagonist in any supposedly directed at children movie right behind uh, Death from uh, Puss in Boots Two. Reboot was also my intro to cosmic horror since the characters, uh, since to the characters, the user is a godlike being who can delete them all without ever knowing they existed and which they cannot communicate with. Which is again one of those things where like, um, you can get away with a lot of shit in children TV because the, the children are not gonna read that deep into it, you know, but doesn't change the fact that this is still, uh, there on display for like more grown and the audience to to get grasp that's why like shows and movies for all ages they are meant to do to be that for all ages you know uh, this was like 12 or up he mentioned i think but like you know 
clearly there is something there even like for grown ass fucking adults to uh to grasp for to the promise of a true viral threat behind the scenes a super virus Damon. she's infected the entire guardian collective to megabytes transformation into a trojan type virus classification uh, to the return to mainframe, to the grand musical finale, I could literally sit here and reminisce until you got sick of hearing me talk about it, and then some. Even after it was a wrap, I remember shouting at the TV, It's not over, we've never solved the Damon threat, and we talked about the Guardian Conclave. You can't lie to me, I know, I've been listening! And, as if mainframe entertainment heard my cries, two years later, in 2001, came the unexpected surprise of Damon Rising and My Two Bobs. The two send-off movies that close up a long, open thread that serves as season four. The process of watching Reboot from pilot to finale, starting at age 10 and ending at 16, was like tuning in for the Magic School Bus and slowly watching it become Dune over the course of six years. <laughs> when it ended... Oh, that's fucking crazy. For good, it did so on an oddly open note, one where the main threats are dealt with, but Megabyte acquires the power of the principal office that he's been after for pretty much the entire series. Though, instead of going into one of his habitual dictatorial monologues, he promises simply to hunt and delete everyone who has crossed him. Prepare yourselves for the hunt. We prepared ourselves for the hunt, but the hunt never came. My initial hunch that this might have been a gamble at enticing interest for a new season was not that far off from the truth. There was actually a third film planned that never made it to production, thus ending the story prematurely. Mentally, I closed the book. I was sad it didn't get the full closure that it deserved, but I Man, the fucking music uh, from this show is great. Holy. Uh, without spoiling much, there's an episode that affected me deeply as a kid where a huge amount of people are going to die with no way to save them and how they face death was different. Uh, some drank with friends, some hugged their families and some waited for the end patiently because they had nowhere else to be. How they handled death was something I found fascinating as a kid. Holy shit. I mean, yeah, they, they can say, uh, they, they can say like, they can have death and like this grisly fucking depiction of it because you know, they don't die, they get uh, deleted. Just like in fucking Adventure Time, the butt of one of jokes uh, is death literally like uh, two fucking idiots get get uh, to fulfill their wish like any wish they wanted and one of them wishes for a box because he's fucking stupid and he wants a box to lie in and the other one immediately wishes without like a second to think to pop like a balloon and he fucking explodes and dies but it's played as a joke because you know Oh, he, he didn't die, he popped like a balloon, you know. Ambiguous, uh, you cannot, uh, you, you cannot, you know, you cannot tell me that they died. It was very ambiguous, you cannot censor this, you know. Uh, the gap in intended audience will greatly change how you perceive it. If you're exposed to it as a kid, the impact will be a lot stronger. True. I was happy that it did get those two final films that came out of nowhere answered almost all my questions and it gave a personal resolution to most of the cast so like it didn't end it didn't end that badly i i thought it ends like on a huge cliffhanger but all in all not a bad ending so far here lies reboot one of my favorite shows of all time nothing nothing will take those memories away Okay, so it didn't end there. Okay, okay. November 30th, 2001. The final film, My Two Bobs, airs and reboot ends. Years go by. Mainframe, known for this point for TV shows such as Beast Wars, Shadow Raiders, and Action Man, begins the second phase of its life, producing direct-to-video movies for Barbie, Hot Wheels, and Tony Hawk. Also notable is the 2000... What? ...direct-to-video movies for Barbie, Hot Wheels, and Tony Hawk. Um, as a big fan of the Tony Hawk franchise, I have never fucking heard about Tony Hawk in Boom Boom Sabotage. What the fuck is that, man? Holy... 
Meanwhile, my little pony death na two graphic get turned into conscious stone statue. Yes, some some child media had literal fates worse than death as a censor to death, man. It's so fucking backwards. Also, you have to, like, remember that the creators were on a whim of the censor. Like, whatever the censor deemed inappropriate, inappropriate was just inappropriate. And that's fucking wild because that can vary from person to person, you know? The Tony Hawk movie apparently was not great. The name alone looks like a shit post. Yeah, what the fuck is that? Talk. Oh yeah, the Shadow Realm was definitely one of those censorship decisions that was like, how is that better than just fucking death, man? Holy. Also notable is the 2003 Spider-Man animated series, and for stepping in for the final episodes of Max Steel, making the seasons that came before that look pretty embarrassing in contrast. Rumors of another season of Reboot fly fast and loose amongst fans for years, but ultimately nothing surfaces. Late 2004, a reboot spin-off series called Binomes is planned, but never released. July 20th, 2006, Rainmaker Income Fund acquires Mainframe Entertainment. January 31st, 2007, Mainframe Entertainment is renamed Rainmaker Studios. As Rainmaker, the studio drops all other brands and begins almost exclusively making direct-to-video Barbie movies. God damn. As of all other brands and begins that, on- That is- uh, Speaking of fate worse than death, man. Holy fuck. This is a fate worse than death. Censors be like, death? You're insane! Make them suffer forever instead. That's better. Almost exclusively making direct-to-video Barbie movies. Oh, they made the Ratchet and Clank movie? That one was- That one was good, right? At least it looks fucking amazing. I never like uh, seen it. They made like 30 bar Barbie movies. Holy shit. As bro. of current year, there are 30 of them. June 12th, 2007. In an almost foreboding move suggesting the end of an era, the Art of Reboot book is released. I talked to Jim Sue about the current state of affairs. He's a pretty cool guy. July 23rd, 2007. Rainmaker Animation announces the return of Reboot as a film trilogy. Mm. Collaboration with company Zero... Yeah, le let's see those movies, man. I'm sure they will uh, release, like, uh, fucking... They will release any minute now. To I'm Heroes sure. is announced as well. A press release details that the film trilogy and the accompanying comic will quote-unquote draw on the fan base to help drive the creative while empowering the fans' voices in the show's direction. That sounds like a little nothing mumbo jumbo uh, corporate speak. Reasonable individuals question the sanity of this concept, but excitement for the return of reboot overshadows all. As it often does. They will come out any day now. Any day now. Early 2008, reboot.com is updated with a countdown clock and a mailing list for all reboot reboot related announcements. Hype intensifies. A fan submitted pitch contest is held for the webcomic. And May 30th, 2008. The countdown clock runs out and issue one of Reboot Paradigms Lost is released. October 6th, 2009. A 15-second teaser is released, briefly showing a much more futuristic mainframe city. A new voice announces warning, incoming game, as a GameCube descends. A new logo appears reading Reboot, prepare for the upgrade. It is simultaneously everything and nothing all at the same time. December 3rd, 2010. After a decade of waiting, the original show finally makes it to DVD. Fans hope that this resurgence- This didn't have a DVD release until 2010? That's fucking insane, man. What the hell? The DVD craze, like, putting everything on DVDs was so fucking long ago. Holy shit. This could somehow build the momentum for an anticipated reboot reboot and go to sleep staring at the ceiling. February 2011, Rainmaker pulls the reboot movie trailer offline and removes all references to reboot oh. from their site. Oh. <laughs> November 15th, 2012, Chinese studio Zing Zing Digital attempts to buy out Rainmaker, but fails. The CEO is replaced. Michael Hefferon replaces Catherine Winder as the Rainmaker president. 
September 30th, 2013. Press release. The return mm. of Reboot. Rainmaker announces that Reboot is getting rebooted. But it's back to being an animated TV series. And it's in celebration of the 20th anniversary coming up in 2014. And Rainmaker's TV and, division... And it will come out any second now. Any second now. Changes its name back to Mainframe Entertainment. Fans are delighted at the news that things are going to totally be exactly the way they were, guys. Totally the same. No need to worry, guys. Hey. Fans begin to worry. Huffington Post writes a thing, and everyone gets excited because it's the first they're hearing of a reboot reboot. Except it's not. But it might as well be because it's unreasonable to expect people to remember a press release from seven years prior that leads to nothing. October 31st, 2013. It's revealed that Rainmaker is bleeding money at losses of over a million a year. It's been going for quite some time and apparently they were demoted from the Toronto Stock Exchange board, prompting the aforementioned attempt of a takeover by Zing Zing. Fans string together the likely narrative that every empty press release over the years has actually been an attempt to drum a pipe in the hopes of attracting a miracle investor. It's also revealed that the new show will have very little to do with the old one. In an interview with Michael Heffron, he states, quote, I don't think too many people would remember what a dot matrix is anymore. I think there's always opportunity to bring characters back for fun cameo appearances. We're very big fans of the characters, the world. But now trying to say, how do those... But like, they don't need to know what a dot matrix is. It's just a fucking name for the character. And if they are curious, they can look it up. What the fuck do you mean? Man, those executive suits always worry about the most fucking pointless stuff ever. Like they will, they will change everything for the sake of change just because. And then they will serve you up the weakest fucking excuse you have ever heard in your life. What the fuck? characters and worlds fit in today for a new generation of kids who don't know anything about the previous reboot. A follow they don't need to! If they get curious, they can fucking buy the DVD or like watch it on the internet, man. The interview with the fan site Reboot Revival reveals that some quotes were out of context, quote unquote, and that old characters will play a key role. November 27th, 2014, Rainmaker announces the name Reboot the Guardian Code. The line, being reimagined for its 20th anniversary, gets touted around a whole lot, despite nothing actually coming out on said anniversary besides said announcement. Huffington Post writes another thing. Fans rub their eyes, look at the calendar to double check to make sure they're not hallucinating that yes, despite some excited text messages blowing up their phones, this is in fact the fifth time that the Reboot Reboot has been announced. Fans decide to continue living their now adult lives. Elsewhere, in a place that doesn't exist, someone attempts to celebrate their wedding anniversary day by announcing the announcement that there will totally be a big celebration coming someday. Partner is told, stay tuned, lol. June 8th, 2015. Chorus Greenlight's reboot, The Guardian Code. An image of a shiny helmet reflecting a sort of but not quite megabyte looking thing is released. June 6th. 2016. It was okay. a first Actually, something is happening. Actually, something is happening, man. Even adding Enzo was actually a corporate decision, so it's not a surprise in hindsight that they cut out his eye and crushed his skull. <laughs> Every single time we remake this, but it's not going to have any OG characters or stories or vibes. By the way, it's an alternate universe so we can do what we want every single time for no fucking reason by the way other than to just keep the name the owners just really wanted the series to become one of the most mismanaged ips in the world don't you get it man strong the witcher the strong netflix is the witcher uh flashbacks i'm having guys uh, when i'm reading all of this stuff it's kind of like the Snyder Cut thing, only the majority of fans aren't fanatical edgelords, edgelords in, uh, in brackets, I hope. <laughs> Light that the casting sides crawled from out the depths and beached themselves on our shores. Oh man, the copium 
is strong in some communities, what can I say? Fans around the world worked restlessly to save the village from certain death by pushing the bloated, gaseous corpse back from whence it came. For if left unchecked, it surely shall burst and spread festering disease, damning all life on the island. But lo, it was not meant to be. For when the naive village folk set eyes upon the great bloat, only too late did they realize that there was not one, nor two, but five swollen, fetid, decaying omens of certain extinction sprawled out in invitation on the beach. Bodies though they were, it could not be said whether or not these heaving sacks of veiny flesh had ever held the breath of life. I'm thinking we uh, took a turn here. To call them creatures would diminish the putrid sense of horrible other beyond the knowable. The very concept of endless gnawing pain, the thing they call home. Five they were. And in the village elder's eye, they reflected. With a single tear that never fell, he knew their names. He had always known their names. Austin, the skater dude. Parker, the techno geek. Tamra, the intense, opinionated alt chick. Gray, the jock. And Hold on, hold on. What are we doing? What, what the fuck? What are we doing? What are we doing? What is happening? What are you, what are you throwing at me right now, man? Vera, the attractive Asian AI. October Vera. There's no way they described it like that, right? The attractive, attractive mentioned the, uh -huh. okay. Asian AI. AI. October 25th, 2016. Rainmaker announces proudly. What the fuck, man? So the Guardian Code decided that it was lame to have a series inside a computer. That's the basis of the entire fucking show! What do you mean they decided it's lame? That's, that's like, that's like the entire fucking point of the show. An agreement for a transformative transaction with Frederator Networks and Erzin Hirsch Entertainment, an $11 million unwritten private placement, and a proposed corporate reorganization to create, wow, unlimited media ink, words, words, language words, why do all press releases sound like this? A marketing True. trailer for a card game adaptation accidentally reveals CG footage from the show. They're promptly scrubbed off the face of the internet. March 28th, 2017. Official screenshots of the live action and CG cast are revealed. Fans take a moment to whisper a question to the Lord about where the money is in resurrecting an old beloved thing, but targeting said thing at people who do not know the thing, while actively upsetting those that do. It would later be revealed that the series is slated for Netflix worldwide, except for Canada, which would only see the show on YTV one month later. YTV releases initial promotional material on Twitter. Fans respond. YTV is not very amused. February 21st, Twand. Y you are blocked from following YTV and viewing YTV's tweet. <laughs> Curtain. I have never watched Reboot, but excuse me? I mean, that's, that's valid. Holy shit, even, even like people here in the chat and me who have never seen the show are like what the fuck are you doing bro itv is not very amused february 21st 2018 it is revealed via a series of many interviews that michael hefferon's goal with reboot the guardian code is to inspire the kids it is revealed that michael hefferon's son for example wants to be just quoting a great uh, fucking i think nba pl player Yo, fuck the kids. The kids who fucking watched Reboot are now adults who want to watch a continuation of Reboot, possibly more like, you know, targeted at uh, adult audiences. How about you cater to them? You know what fucking gets me? 
You know what gets me every time? Companies think that adult, like cartoons, adult shows, they don't make as much money as kids cartoons. And then you have like, uh, you fucking go on on the internet and you uh, check what is popular in 2024 and it's like Rick and Morty, Invincible fucking a bunch of other like adult shows that i don't uh that i'm not that familiar with and it's like what are you doing man like you don't need to target kids specifically what the fuck it's like the main character austin the leader of the new teens and the guardians of the show it is also revealed that michael heffron's son's name is austin February 21st, 2018, the official trailer for Reboot the Guardian Code is released. Remember when they, uh, remember when they adapted Castlevania into like a T-rated show that didn't contain any violence or sex? Oh wait, it was a fucking hugely popular adult fucking cartoon, man. Cartoon as in the, the style, I suppose. Like, why not? Why not fucking make it? Why not make it for, for a little bit of a more mature audience? That's, that's just it. Pale, un that's all you had to do. Caring sun sets on a young bird that hit the sidewalk before it learned to fly. A dog cries voicelessly for reasons it doesn't fully understand when brought to its owner's grave. A middle-aged woman looks out of an office window and realizes that her children have not spoken to her in years because she's become exactly like her mother. An old man with hours left to live feels deep fear as he realizes that he's forgotten the name of his deceased wife. The door shuts, devouring the last bit of light in the room, as the newborn in Cradle spends its first night alone and comes to understand that profound loneliness is the way of things. So why not this, but cut out all the live action bits? Like, <laughs> what can you even fucking say? Reboot the Guardian Code premieres March 30th on Netflix. Oh man, now, now I kinda get it, you know, now I kinda get the hype around uh, fucking reboot, holy, and now I understand what happened to it, holy shit. I would highly recommend uh, looking up, looking at the clip who is number one for a great showcase of what the series was like in later seasons. Have you anything to say before I execute you? Sorry, past sentence. Bob, please, help me. I have to end this. I have to know who is number one. Guilty, 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 guilty. You've killed everyone. Good. Haven't you figured it out yet? I know I have. We all have. Tell me who is number one. I am number one. I am the driving force in your life. I am hatred. I drive you on and consume you. No Holy fuck, that reminds me of, uh, of like the Green Goblin scenes from Spider-Man 1. No! I am number one. I care for no one. That's not true. I love Andrea. 
No, you don't. You love yourself. Just looking out for number one. No! Not you! I am number one. The original. Do you think this is a game? Do you? But how? You're me. But you hate me. You must. Look at what you've become. You're wrong. I had to become bigger, tougher. I had to be ready for Megabyte to survive the game. It's kind of fucking crazy that certain like movements and uh, dialogue kind of and voice acting kind of reminds me of um, uh, Xavier Renegade the Angel. <laughs> games. Did you like the games more than Mainframe? More than your family? No, no, I didn't. I was trapped in the games. Games, games, games. It was only a game. You killed my family! My family! You've forgotten your family! You let yourself become a prisoner of the games. What would Bob think of you now? Bob... There can be only one. Be seeing you. Wow, what a great, uh, what a great ch children's cartoon that surely would not traumatize anyone. I can't think of any other fan base with uh, that has been jerked around this much. This was the reason Reboot went uh, so long without a DVD. Without a fan base so dedicated, the series would have just vanished. Great kids show. Oh yeah, man. So yeah, uh, that was the that was the forgotten history of reboot by Woody Versus. What a fucking cool ass look back at a show that I have never watched, but uh, I am very interested in now. That's genuinely fantastic scene direction for the time period. Oh yeah, like holy fuck, man! And for a children's show, for a children's show, that's crazy, bro. TV sure was different in the 90s. Yeah, but also like, um, also like Reboot is a fringe example of that because there was also like a lot more generic shows that I, that, uh, that were popular but are uh, rightfully forgotten now. But obviously e each time period has its like hidden gems and pearls and whatever. The whole series is currently on YouTube as well. That's nice. That's nice. At least, at least the Reboot fans get something i guess i wish they had like something better than what happened to them but you know that's life what can i say so yeah that was the forgotten history of reboot uh, by willy versus thank you for those of you watching later on youtube uh means a word to me that you stick around to the end of the fucking video and you know power one out for uh reboot fans out there huh and if you are a reboot fan i will pour one out for you because that is sad, that's just sad.